All right. Um, let me turn on the screen, too. You've got until tomorrow at 1 p.m. to submit the pumps homework assignment. And uh, as I mentioned before, the solution to that assignment will appear at 1 p.m. And then Wednesday in class, we'll have our exam. Uh, it's going to be all problem solving. There won't be any conceptual questions, like short answer type stuff. It's just all problem solving for the exam. Uh, you should bring a laptop computer that has Excel on it. If you think back, um, you know, quite a lot of the methods we've used this semester use Excel. Everything from uh, three reservoirs to solving the Colebrook equation to Hardy-Cross equation and so on, Hardy-Cross method and more. So there will be at least one question where you need to use your computer. Um, it's classes 1 through 16, each of which of those has a lecture recorded on YouTube, although I don't recommend going back and watching those. I don't think that would be very useful. Looking at your uh, homework assignments and some of the in-class examples that we've solved probably is a, a good approach. I'll print out the formula sheets, but if you want to take a look to just get familiar with what's available and what form the equations are, that's available now on Blackboard. And that'd be another good way to study. I think for the most part, the formulas are presented in order. So that if you know how to use each one of those formulas, that's just another way to uh, double check that uh, your studying is effective. Any announcement questions that you've got before we jump into the design project? Yeah. Yeah, good question. Good question. Um, hmm. No, you need to start from a blank workbook. But um, but you can bring one page of notes where you put the column definitions. You know, like um, so. I'm providing the the formula sheet, uh, but you can bring a page. You know, like where you would say what's in each column for the Hardy-Cross method. You can write your own page of notes. And so I'm going to make this adjustment here. Uh, you may bring your own page of notes. You can put anything you want on that page of notes. But not just your cell thing? Anything you want. Supportive notes from your grandma, little <laughs> drawings of uh, Quotes to inspire you, you know, like Nelson Mandela stuff, whatever you want. Yeah, but um, we, it's got to be starting from a blank workbook. Otherwise, uh, I'm not able to really assess what you know versus what you've done in the past and what template files I've given you. So the, the clearest way to, uh, to draw that distinction, I think, is you started from scratch with Excel, even if you did have a page of notes. Can be whatever you want. Yeah, can be just a picture. No, uh, <laughs> no, it can be uh, letter size, but it can be really small print. You can bring a microscope if you need to. Yeah, a little scanning electron microscope, and you could fit a lot on a page if you're using an SEM. Dr. Ian said he actually had a kid thing in magnifying glass. Really? <laughs> oh, jeez, come on. Yeah. Well, I had one semester where I gave the students bonus points if they didn't bring an equation sheet. Like an equation sheet was allowed, but I gave you pro bonus points if you didn't bring one. And even before the bonus points, the students who didn't have the equation sheet did better. Because I did it for exam two in fluid mechanics when really the only equations you needed are continuity equation, momentum, energy equation. I think that's it. So it's like, the ones who knew that, oh, this is actually pretty simple, they're the ones who did best. But the ones who, like sometimes, have you ever had the, an open book exam and you spent so much time just flipping through the pages that then you didn't have time to solve the, I, I've had that same experience. So sometimes you're actually, having more doesn't help you. So I think the one page may help you though. Is so. that for a magic one page? Oh, <laughs> 
uh, front and back. You may bring your own page of notes. It should be 8.5 by 11, front, front and, and back. You can put anything you want on the page, anything written. It can't be like a little, little leprechaun that knows all the answers, nothing like that. But all right, I think we've covered our bases. Sometimes it seems like uh, certain students have a legal career ahead of them, you know, like looking for all the loopholes. Yeah. All right. So we all set? We got an exam, a celebration of learning on Wednesday. All right. I've handed out just now a map. And um, I guess by now it shouldn't surprise me, but every semester when I look through the feedback on the course, the students really like this project. And I think what it means when you like this project is that you really are an engineer. Because for a lot of you, this may be the first time that you've gone into the iterative process of design, where what you're doing in design is you're assessing the need, you're coming up with a solution, and then you're optimizing the solution. And that iterative process is really the essence of design. And in that process, in this project, you're going to explore all aspects of that process. And so the first of the steps is trying to figure out how big of the thing you need to make. And in this case, what we're going to be designing is a water supply network for a hypothetical development. So right now, in this hypothetical development, all that there is is just an empty hillside. And um, you know, let's talk about some of the features that's on the map that I gave you. First of all, you can see that there are contour lines. And those contour lines describe the elevation. So where it says 275, that along that thick brown line, that is every place on that line has an elevation of 275 meters. And so then if you count down by increments of 5 meters, it's 275, 270, 265, 260, 255, 250. And so then here is the 250 meter elevation line. So this is a relatively steep hillside. And then when the contour lines are further apart, that is an indication that the slope isn't as steep. You can see that it's a scaled map. And I've printed it out at 11 by 17 because what that enables you to do is measure to scale. One centimeter on that page represents 100 meters in this hypothetical development that's being built. So you can just get out a ruler and figure out how big certain zones are. You'll see that I've mentioned that there's a north zone, a south zone, and an east zone. And each one of you is going to be assigned different parameters. For example, how many people live in the north zone. And not actually, I don't tell you directly how many people live there. I tell you how many people there are per hectare. And remember, a hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters. So I tell you the population density in the north zone. And for one student, it will be 20 people per hectare. For another student, it's 300 people per hectare. So you're getting wildly different population densities in the north zone. Uh, there's also commercial areas. And so I tell you how many people are in commercial area, in the commercial parts of the, I think the commercial is in just the north zone. Um, you can see that there are these additional exterior features, like there's a sports stadium that's being built in this development, a hospital, a housing project, a golf course, a, a factory. There's a factory inside the east zone and one outside the east zone. So in this design project, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be using these characteristics that I give you for you know, what's going on inside this place to try and estimate how much water they need. And then you're going to, after you estimate how much water they need, you're going to go through the process of designing how big the pipe should be. And sizing the pipe balances out two things. You're balancing out the cost of the pipe. And so you know, trying to keep the cost low says, let's make the pipe as small as possible. 
but then also you want to deliver enough pressure to people who are using the water in this development. And to develop adequate pressure at all points in the network, that means the pipe should be big. So you're bumping up against these two constraints where you want to minimize the pipe size, but also you want to maximize the pressure that you're delivering to people at a certain junction. Not necessarily maximize, you want to not go above a certain limit. But that's going to be your iterative process is trying to find out just the perfect size of the pipes. Uh, you know, another aspect of it is that you're going to be uh, trying to identify the optimal layout for the pipes. Because although the north zone is this box, you know, it's a, a rectangle that goes from location A down to this boundary and over to the side and then up. So the north zone is a rectangle. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to put pipes everywhere in that rectangle because what you need to do is you need to deliver water at location A, B, C, is there no D? I guess not. F. At all these green arrows are locations where water is coming out of the pipe network. So you can try and connect the dots with the, uh, the shortest length possible. So for example, if you're going to be connecting a water pipeline that goes, the water enters the network at A. Because what we're saying is up here on your handout, there's a little symbol around the 300 mark. Do you see that little spider looking symbol? That's where there's a natural spring. So that's where the water is available. Somewhere on this hillside, you're going to put a storage tank. And the location on the hillside determines how much pressure there is at junction A. Because if you put the water tank here at 225, it's not very high on the hill. So there's not much of an elevation difference. It's not going to cause much pressure at A. But if you put the tank all the way up at 300, then that may be too high, potentially, if there's an upper limit of the acceptable pressure. And what I tell you in the handout is that the upper pressure limit is 850 kilopascals. So you're going to have to, in the hydraulic design software you're using for this, kind of optimize the, the right location for the reservoir because that pressurizes the network, but then the water gets into the network at A and you need to deliver water at each of these grain arrows. So for example, the water that is feeding the uses inside the north zone, there's just two green arrows. It's A and M. So those are the arrows that provide water for the interior uses of the north zone. You'll notice that here's location B. That's just only the water that's going to the sports stadium. Location B does not satisfy any of the demands in the north zone. But uh, you also have to get water down here to I. So the, the point I'm making is that you don't have to go down and then sideways. You can just connect the two locations directly with a pipeline that goes straight from K to I. So you're optimizing both the diameter of the pipes, but also where should they be located to try and minimize the total length of pipeline required. Because in the handout I've given you, you'll see that there's a cost associated with the pipes. Let me go here to Blackboard and pull up that handout. It's under the project folder. So design project handouts and resources. So here is the description of the project. So I tell you how much a meter of each pipe costs. So a meter of 100 millimeter diameter pipe is $38. Uh, a meter of 150 millimeter pipe is $40. So you have to spend a little bit more because it's a larger diameter, but you're going to be able to convey more flow with less pressure drop for the larger size pipe. So you want to try and overall minimize the pipe diameter because that's going to save money. And in the end, you're going to have to do a cost analysis that takes into account both the, uh, the pipe that you put in and also the size of the storage tank that's going to go up here on the hillside. So if we go back here somewhere, you're going to find out what elevation you would like to put that reservoir and then how big it should be. 
based on the demands and how they vary through, uh, through time. So phase one of the project is demand estimation. And let's talk a little bit about demand variation over time. People use water in different ways throughout the day. For example, um, in the summertime, most people use more water than they do during the winter. Um, and it's largely, you know, across the U.S., the difference is mostly due to irrigation. People watering their garden. In some places, they have to water the grass in their yard if they don't have very much rainfall. In your project, what I say is, I'm going to be assigning you a town. Look up the average amount of rain they get in that town for the driest month of the year. And then assume that the grass needs uh, an inch per week. And then the difference between the precipitation and the inch per week that's required is how much water you have to provide for irrigation. So you're going to be taking into account the domestic use demands for water. Uh, there's a golf course that has to be irrigated. There is the risk of a fire breaking out. And you have to provide for fire flows. There's a food processing plant where I tell you what demand there is for water at the food processing plant and the cardboard box factory. And there's a hotel where you're going to have to look up and try and think, well, how is the use of water in a hotel different from the use of water in someone's house? And there are some resources that I've made available on Blackboard that kind of address some of those things. There is this example, Resources for Estimating Demand. This is just to give you a sense for what kind of data is out there. For example, there is data that, what would be a good one to show you? Here's a good one. Um, this estimates that uh, across the country, the average demand for water is 220 liters per person per day. That's a nationwide average. And it breaks it down into where does that 220 liters per day per person come from? Some of it's for flushing toilets, some of it's for hand washing and showers, kitchen use. So you can see what that all adds up to. And it also has data related to different types of facilities besides the home. You know, usage in a hotel. And it says that a certain amount of the water use in the hotel is for guests that are staying there overnight. A certain amount of it has to do with the employees that are working there. And it has a wide range of different commercial facilities. And you can see sometimes it's based on the uh, the type of place it is. If it's like a, a self-service laundromat, you can see it would be for each machine that's there, how much water they use per day, or you know, for each wash that's being done at a laundry facility. So this is just an example. And in part, what you're going to be doing in this project is trying to find better data than this example that I've provided you. Because this is relatively old. Like this data is from. 1987 and uh, a lot of it is just general data for like nationwide averages but you're going to be assigned a, a different city than just a nationwide average you know, somebody's got Sacramento somebody's got Denver somebody's got St. Louis and so on so what you'll be doing is trying to find out how do people use water in the location that you're assigned and if you search and can't find anything, it's OK to use these nationwide estimates. But in most cases, I think you'll be able to find um, location-specific data that talks a little bit more about what the water demand is in those locations. And when you do find out how people use water at that spot, an important part of what we're doing in this project is looking at the daily variation. So um, for an average day, the, uh, the size of the pipes is going to be having a different effect than on the peak day. So this graph is just showing as a percent of the average daily use. You remember it's 200 and 220 liters per person per day was the average um, demand. And if we change that to liters per second, 220 liters per person per day 
220 liters per person per day divided by 86,400 seconds per day. So what that means is 86,400. I'm dividing 0 0.00255 liters per second. So that's how much water you use per second if you're the average person. But I'm not using any water right now, not at all. I use my water and like at, at different times. Um, and if you have like a bunch of people, what this graph is showing is that, for example, during the nighttime hours, there's relatively low demand for water. But then there's a morning bump when people are getting ready for the day and washing their morning dishes. Water demand sags during the afternoon, but then it peaks really at its highest in the evening where maybe some people are watering their lawns, some people are taking showers or doing dishes or laundry. So this variation in water use through the day results in peaking factors. And in the project, you're going to find out what is your average demand, like how much is going to be used on an average day, and then you're going to develop from that an estimate of the maximum daily demand, and then also going so far as uh, the maximum hourly demand. And in our textbook, what it says is that um, the maximum hourly demand would be 3.25 times the average day. So if the average person uses 220 liters per person per day, and that works out to you know, 0 0.00, 255 liters per second. During the peak hour, I'm using 3.25 times that much, and so is everyone else. So um, you want to size your pipes so that they don't just work on an average day, but you want to size the pipes that they're going to work when the city's completely built out, when uh, you've got your maximum population density, and when it's the worst case scenario, meaning that it's a really dry day, during the summer, there's a fire somewhere. And so all of those potential uses are occurring simultaneously. You're going to design your water network to uh, satisfy all of those requirements. Um, let me pause for a second so I can hand out both the uh, parameter assignments and then also I want to show you the summary table for a moment. Okay, um, so I've just showed you the parameter assignments. You know what city you've got and how many, what's the population density in different places and what's the demand at the box factory and so on. Um, let's look at the demand estimation table because I think that's going to really clarify what sorts of things have to be accounted for. The project folder. All right, so phase one of the project is figuring out how much water do they need. So there's going to be a certain amount of water that you have to account for the risk of fire. So the needed fire flow will be this starting point. And then all of your flow rates should be expressed in terms of liters per second. So when you do your, let's say you find some data that says in Minneapolis, instead of 220 liters per second or per day, maybe people in Minneapolis on average only use 180 liters per person per day. So then you're going to find out how many people there are in your north zone, and you're going to multiply that by the average 180 liters per person per day, and then you're going to divide that by 86,400 to convert from days to seconds. So you're going to find out the average flow rate per day and then the peak flow rate per day, if we go back to this slide, the peak daily demand is 1.8. So the peak flow rate per day is 1.8 times the average flow rate per day. And then the peak hour per day is 3.25 times the average day. And so then you'd add up here in this column the fire flow plus the peak day and then in the design flow, you're going to pick the larger of the two, the larger of 
peak hour or peak day plus fire. And then you're also going to add on the peak hourly flow for the commercial demands. And we assume in this project that you don't have to add on the fire flows for commercial areas because they have their own built-in sprinkler systems that reduces the demand for um, firefighting. You know, that is prevention. You wouldn't get a big building fire out of control if you've got sprinklers like you would in a residential structure that doesn't have sprinklers, hopefully. Then design flow rate per outlet. Let's look at the map. How many outlets are there in the north zone? There's two. There's this junction A and junction M. So this, for the north zone, you'd find out what's the design flow rate at location A and location M. So you know during this design condition how much water is going to be going out at that location. And the same thing going through the process for the south zone where there's only residential areas, there's no commercial areas. In the east zone you can see there's a hotel, there's a food processing plant, there's a shopping mall, and you're going to have to justify your amounts. What you submit for part one is partly calculations, you know, like, and preferably hand calculations. You can do it on Excel, but if you do, it needs to be logical and easy to follow without me having to look at cell equations. You know, like when, when you have your hand calculations, I can follow what step-by-step -step assumptions you've made to get to your final answer. And you need to have that same kind of annotation if you choose to use Excel, which I discourage for part one of the project where you're doing the demand estimation. I think the hand calculations are just more natural. But in any case, your, uh, your submission for part one of the project is both these calculations that show how you came up with what the amounts are, and then also you're explaining what data or assumptions you've made to base those calculations on. So for example, you're saying, I found this website resource for Minneapolis. It's the Water Board of Minneapolis, and they said that the average demand is 180 liters per person per day. Or you maybe found some specific information about a hotel in Minneapolis and what their demands are. Or maybe you didn't, and you're just saying, I used the, uh, the, um, the given resource, and quote the, the citation of, you know, what was the per guest and you know how many guests you have in the hotel and so you know just kind of laying out the case for this estimate of the demand. Now this is the kind of depth of design that would be do that would be done in the initial planning stages of a project where you're not going to take the design all the way to construction ready but you're going to be doing enough of the design that you could get cost an analysis to a pretty high degree of certainty that you know you've got the right pipe sizes for the main trunk line network you know what the cost is going to be so this is like a 30 percent design so in part one of the project you're figuring out what is the demand in part two you're actually sizing the pipes in part three you're sizing the uh, the reservoir that provides the water to the network and then uh, the final project is to kind of clean up all of those draft submissions that you've been doing along the way, which I'll be providing feedback to you, uh, making adjustments where necessary, and then also including the cost analysis, uh, which isn't going to be submitted at the draft phase. The cost analysis is just in the final report. So. Um, each year I try and make clarifications and improvements to the assignment description and uh, I would really encourage you to read over that carefully. This, um, this project description here is four pages long and it's, it would really be criminal negligence for you to start the project without reading this all the way through. Read the entirety of this description and then you know if you don't understand kind of the main idea of the project after reading this then uh, please let me know because it's really important that you have a clear understanding of what that report is supposed to look like. And you'll notice that there are these submissions along the way. So the first thing you need to do is uh, to be submitted on Monday, March 7th. So that gives you, I think, two weeks from today. And uh, that draft submission of your demand estimation is worth 
20% of the overall project grade. So the majority of the project grade comes from the final report, which isn't in submitted until Monday, April 18th. But there's enough points along the way to give you an incentive to really try and make each one of these a good, clear expression of what you've done so far. So what questions do you have about the project so far? Anything that's coming to mind that you want to discuss already? On the residential fire flows is the lookup. Yep, that's something that are, that's defined, the fire demands are defined in the spreadsheet table that I've just given you. Yeah. So that's going to be an easy one for filling in the table. Um, by the way, this table, this summary table, has to be the first page of your submission for part one. Now, you're going to be doing your own calculations uh, in subsequent pages, but this should be page one of what you submit on Monday, March 7th, is filling in this table so that I have an idea of, of what you think the demands are. I've done calculations for each one of you. Like, I know what I think the demands should be. And if you're within a certain range, that's totally understandable. And if yours is wildly different from mine, but you have a valid justification or assumption, then that's fine too. Um, but based on my kind of ballpark estimate of what I think the demands should be, that can give me some place to know what to, to hone in on if I think there might be a mistake in your calculations. So for example, if, if you have a certain number of rooms in your hotel, then I have a rough idea, I think, of what should be the average day, peak day, and peak hour demands in the hotel. Other questions about the project so far? What is NFO? Needed fire flow. What else? Will it be permissible to use uh, EPA net uh, in the design to size the pipes out? You can use EPA net if you like, but WaterCAD's the much better pro program. Um, and I think that uh, some of you are in um, hydrologic engineering. And we, we ran into an unexpected problem with the licensing on StormCAD. And uh, Bentley has gotten back to me. I think WaterCAD will work without any fix. Like, it'll already have enough. Um, the, the license they give us for academic use is good enough to do this project. But even if it wasn't by default, there's a fix where we could request an upgrade to the license. But yes, you can use EPA net, but WaterCAD's just the, the better product. And um, part of the reason for that is that with WaterCAD, you can bring an image in the background and then draw on top of it. So you can bring in the network map. Let me show you that uh, one of the things that's here is this map is a PDF file. But the other map, this one, is a scaled um, TIFF file. Let's just see where to open that. OK, it's in my downloads. So EPA net, oh, I'm sorry, um, WaterCAD. Let me start a new WaterCAD model. What we can do with WaterCAD is um, bring in that image. I just downloaded the TIFF file. And I've set up that TIFF file so that, oh, I need to set this to units of meters. Hold on a second. Tools, options, units of SI. Okay, I'm in SI units now, I think. If I reset. If you, uh, if you start in the wrong units, you have to start over again. So now I can see it's in meters. Um, So the, one of the advantages of WaterCAD is that um, you can bring in a turning off compression, because I get an error message if I leave it on. Use compression. Turn that off. Uh, so this is the map. And you can draw the pipes right on top of it. And it will know the, the length of the pipes just based on where you click. So it's kind of a nice advantage. 
Um, so on the subject of WaterCAD, I'm going to do a, a quick demonstration today just to so, oh well, we've, it's 1.39. We don't have a lot of time. Let me um, just show you the simplest possible. Have we used WaterCAD before? Did we use it in fluid mechanics? No, we used EPA net. We used EPA net? All right, well the good news is Bentley made all this stuff free. I think enough professors kind of got fed up with things that they had to capitulate and they made the software free. So I think it's good for us to use this, although I won't insist on it. If you, if you prefer EPA net, you can. But um, let me just start a new network here and what you can do is right click reservoir. I'm just going to draw a reservoir and a couple of junctions based off of that. So all right, so you can guess what this is. This is a reservoir, which is I'm going to specify how high the water is in the reservoir. And uh, each one of these junctions has an elevation. And I could tell it in a table um, what is the elevation, the physical elevation of that location. So for example, like how you have a contour map, you can use that contour map to find out what's the physical elevation for each of the junctions in your network. And then you could type in that data. So, you know, maybe it's 10, 9, 8, 8, 7, 5, whatever the elevations are. And you can even say how much water is coming out at certain locations. So let's say I know there's demand at junction 6 and junction 4. So here I'm going to say there's a certain amount of demand at junction 6. Maybe it's 100 liters per second. And then over at junction 4, there's a demand of 50 liters per second. All right. Now, there's another table where I can look up all of the characteristics of the pipes. So in this pipe table, I can see there's different diameters. And I could change it. Maybe if I want to make pipe one a little bit bigger, maybe it's a 300 millimeter diameter pipe. Maybe pipe six is a 200 millimeter diameter pipe. So this is that optimization process you're going to go through is trying to change a lot of pipe diameters and seeing how it affects the pressure. Let me just assign an elevation of the water to the reservoir. So right now, I'm going to say that the water elevation in the reservoir is 85 meters. And so when I click on this compute button, what it's going to do is it's going to say, all right, water is going out of the network at junction 4 and junction 6. That water's coming from the reservoir, and it's flowing through this pipe network. So it's going to calculate the pressure at each junction for the size of the pipe that I've got. When I click Compute, it goes through that process. Everything's green, no error message. That's good. Um, and then I can pull up in this flex table. Uh, if I want to look at the junction table, I can see what is the pressure in kilopascals at various locations. And in your project, what you should be looking for is the pressure should never be less than 240 kilopascals. And it should never be higher than 850 kilopascals. I think it mentions that in the, in the handout, that that's the range that we're going for. So right now, our pressure is much higher than it needs to be. So that tells me I could make the pipe smaller and save my client some money if I optimize the pipe diameters. So I don't have to keep opening up the, uh, the junction table. I'm just going to quickly add an annotation here. I'm going to do a junction annotation. So I'm going to click plus over here and right click on the word junction, new annotation. This will feel pretty familiar for those of you who have used StormCAD before. For those of you who haven't, I've got a video that shows the basics of how to use Bentley software. And I'll send you the link to that. But let's just say that I want to annotate the pressure. <coughs> Excuse me. That's just the coronavirus. Pressure P equals, all right. So, all right, so I've got pressure showing up on the map for each of these junctions. And so 
What I could do is also, let me add an annotation for the pipes. I'll annotate the diameter. So new annotation, diameter. Do the labels change as the values change? They do. It is very nice. It, it updates dynamically anytime I make an adjustment. Yeah. So let me apply that. All right, so we've got the diameters and so on. So let's say that I know that the pressures are higher than they need to be. So for example, this 152 millimeter diameter pipe, I'm wasting my client's money because I don't have to deliver this much pressure to junction four under the peak demand. It only needs to be 240 kilopascals. So I'm gonna go into the pipe table and I'm gonna say, well, let's make pipe five smaller than it is right now. If I say pipe five, instead of being 152, let me just see if 100 millimeters keeps me in the OK range. So I can still leave this open. I click Compute again. Keep an eye on this pressure at junction 4. OK, the pressure is now 682. That's still plenty high. So let's make things even smaller. How do I do with a 50 millimeter diameter pipe? This is a big change, though, 100 to, down to 50. This could dramatically change the pressure at junction 4. No, it really didn't. 654. So we can just progressively keep changing the pipe diameters. Like what if I did a global edit? What if I made all of these diameters 50 millimeters? Just to speed this process along, if I make every pipe here 50 millimeters, compute. Oh, well, I went too far. See how I've got negative pressures? That's too low. So what if I did a global edit and let everything be 100 millimeters? All right, well, uh, is that worse than before? I still got a negative pressure here at junction four. But I think you get an idea of what this optimiz optimization process is like. I'm going to just make pipe one a little bit bigger. What if I make, because pipe one is carrying the most flow. What if I made that uh, 200 compute? All right, boy, that fixes everything up quite a lot. So. Pressure at junction four is 383. I just kind of scan around and look at uh, how is the pressure at each spot. And it's only 59 pascals here at junction six. So I'd need to maybe make pipe eight a little bit larger. So in phase two, you're going to be using WaterCAD to Go through the process of change, observe, change, observe, and trying to make each pipe as small as it possibly can be. And they shouldn't all be the same size, especially in the project, because you're going to have like one spot where there's a lot of water going out, maybe to the box factory, and another spot where there's hardly any water going to the high density housing. So, um, like I mentioned at the beginning, this is a project that uh, I think in the past has really captured the student's imagination and is a really great indicator that you're in the right field of engineering and, and design through optimization and iteration. Um, the starting point on the project is to read the handout. There's no substitution. I can't explain it in as much clarity as I've written it. So take a moment to read that handout and then what we will do in a future class is I'm going to ask you to watch the demo for how to use Water Gems, Water CAD. The two are pretty similar. Water CAD is a slightly smaller download, but they function in the same way for the purposes that we've got. So I'm going to ask you to watch that demo and then suggest that you install it on your laptop and bring the computer to class so that we can work this example together. Uh, I may wait for us to do that, though, until, uh, until you've had a little bit of time to install the software. So I'm going to send you an email that has, number one, a link to uh, the video that shows how to use Water Gems and WaterCAD, and also the details how to download and install the software. So look for that. But in the short term, remember that uh, really what you need to be focusing on is that page of notes, preparing. Uh, your really small script for that page of notes that you can bring to the exam on Wednesday. So, homework on Tuesday, exam on Wednesday. That's it for today, though.